So from an XML perspective, we allow for grouping of bean definitions into um, well, sets of beads that are associated with a specific profile. The way that we are doing this is by reusing the beads elements, um, but allowing for nested beads elements. So the, in the XML bean namespace in Spring, beads used to be the top level element only. As of Spring 3.1, these elements can be nested as well. Um, but you may also choose to have separate files with these top level elements. The, the important part is that the profile attribute at the beans level allows for associating all nested bean definitions within this bean section for them to be associated with a specific profile. Those bean definitions are only going to be active if that profile is active. There is the notion of a default profile. Of course, you may have beans that are not associated with any profile, so don't worry. You won't have to, uh, to apply this concept to all of your bean definitions at all. You will only apply this concept to beans that happen to change between profiles, between um, specific target environments that you are designing your application for. So as an um, example that goes with, um, this first one, the data source definition here is different between the production and the embedded environment. The names are completely arbitrary, so you may choose profile names um, that match what your application is doing, uh, that match the terminology that your um, team is using. The embedded data source here is, of course, a completely different data source. It's a locally bootstrapped H2 instance. Um, but it's exposed as a beam with the main data source. Only if profile embedded is active. In the production case, um, a data source of type basic data source above would be used. Of course, in production, if you if you are running in a Java EE server, you could have a JMBI lookup, a JEE JMBI lookup tag up there in the production section. It really depends on the specific target profiles that you design your application for. Historically, of course, all of this was possible before. Um, Spring didn't really get in the way um, of adapting to specific environments. Um, you could, for example, copy specific XML configuration files in, leave out others depending on the target environment. It was usually a build script based solution. But as of Spring 3.1, we allow for um, designing a single sheet deployment unit so that it is capable of adapting to multiple target environments without necessarily um, modifying the actual deployment unit. So in terms of uh, associating specific beans with profiles, we've seen the bean section with its profile attribute. Of course, there's an annotation equivalent um, called add profile which you may choose to use on add configuration classes, but also on individual component classes, add components, add services, add repositories um, that would go with an add profile annotation and only be active, only be actually registered um, with the Spring container if the specific profile happens to be active. Activating profiles is, uh, of course, an important part of this game. Um, there are several default ways of doing it. Um, for example, through well-known profiles, like Spring with profiles for active, um, which could be a system property. It doesn't have to. Um, could live in any property source. Um, but typical ways of doing it would be system profiles, um, web application, context params, and so forth. The um, important benefits as already mentioned, is that the deployment unit doesn't have to be touched. So you could, in the case of a web application, take the very same war file, deploy it to several containers, to several target environments, and depending on the profile settings, depending on uh, environment characteristics uh, that are presented to them, those components living in your application automatically adapt to the environment, specific sets of Beans would be active versus not active 
in other environments. Um, talking about the notion of target environments, um, this would, for example, apply to a local development setting, a target production environment, a staging environment, which uh, may live somewhere in between in terms of the complexity of its setup. So it's primarily about the uh, conceptual stages of um, the life cycle of the application. You could, of course, also use the feature for adapting to specific technical characteristics of your environment, different server vendors, um, different setup strategies for each such server. So the, uh, the uh, um, facilities that we are providing here are really very generally usable. Um, so in terms of uh, making some good use of them, feel free to uh, experiment within your specific application architectures. Moving on to Java-based application configuration, which is, of course, once again, a pretty um, generic term. Um, I already went a bit into what we mean by Java-based application configuration. It's really application-specific container configuration. So we are talking about something that you may happen to know <laughs> from um, an earlier Spring feature, which is XML namespaces. Um, we used to, to explain XML namespaces primarily um, based on the um, convenient container setup. So you just have uh, the context namespace setting up the context annotation config or TX annotation config in the transaction namespace. Um, MVC annotation config in the MVC namespace. So most of um, the XML namespace based functionality that uh, Spring 2.0 introduced, that Spring 2.5 extended a bit, most of this functionality is actually setting up container features. It is basically customizing the container, instructing the container to process parts of your application in specific ways. What we are doing here in uh, the Java-based app config world is basically equivalent. It's not necessarily one-to-one -one mapping. We are trying to do it in a way that is natural from an annotation-based perspective. But at the same time, we are trying hard to reuse um, existing concepts, existing naming, uh, allowing you to reuse your existing know-how um, by not artificially um, going other ways where the XML namespace based terminology is just fine. You will see this in a second. Um, and as mentioned, typical structure setup would be the primary use case for um, researching this feature set. Um, let's look at, the, at a quick, quick example, an example that is actually illustrating several um, related features uh, and interaction between feature configuration classes and configuration classes. So what we call feature configuration is um, basically a variant of the app configuration class um, that Spring through the dough introduced. However, feature configurations have a special life cycle. They are being applied very early in the uh, application context bootstrap phase, basically at the same time that the um, XML namespaces would be would be processed as well. Feature configurations are allowed to have feature methods. Each feature method returns a feature specification. In this case, you, you will know that there is a specific feature specification called TX annotation driven being returned. TX annotation driven is uh, an object that instructs, a feature specification object that instructs the container to set up the annotation processing of the edge transactional annotation processing part of Spring. So TX annotation driven with a builder style API allows you to programmatically configure Spring's transaction support, Spring's annotation based transaction support in particular. This is typically being used, um, of course, in combination with regular edge configuration classes, where the edge configuration class uh, as shown here, would set up the actual strategy beams, um, for example, um, 
the transaction manager in this case, the data source that the transaction manager happens to refer to. And in combination, all of this is basically setting up the, uh, the entire infrastructure that Spring usually has, that a Spring-based application usually has for annotation processing in the transaction space. So you will see that those features really interact. Feature configurations typically point to beams being defined in at configuration classes. They could also point to um, beams defined anywhere else um, in, in principle. But of course, by design, the most natural arrangement is to combine them with at configuration classes. For a comparison, um, just a snippet of the, uh, the typical um, TX namespace uh, equivalent here. And you'll see that the uh, XML namespace version, in terms of its terminology, but also in terms of the general arrangement, is actually quite close to what the feature method um, provides here. So you'll see that basically the naming is uh, similar. The attributes are somewhat similar, even if we use Construct arguments here for the implementation driven. Uh, it's a very natural translation and a reuse of the know-how that you happen to have from Spring XML namespaces. So the, the feature model, the add feature model, is of course uh, a completely extensible model. So fundamentally, the container is able to um, handle any feature configuration classes, any feature methods, any feature specifications, uh, as long as they are being associated with um, executives that are able to translate this into Spring configuration. Spring itself comes with several um, such feature specifications out of the box, of course. And TX annotation driven is, is uh, a good example shown here. So um, moving on to another minor feature. In, uh, in the configuration space, the C namespace for XML configuration is um, basically just a variant of the, uh, the good old P namespace that we happen to have since Spring 2.0. It allows for concise inline specification of construct arguments and construct argument values in this example specifically. It would of course also work with uh, construct argument references. The the idea here is the same as with the P namespace, um, that instead of having nested constructor arg elements, or even a sequence of nested constructor arg elements, uh, you would just have an inline definition within the main beam element, which is much more concise, in particular when being applied to um, a larger group of beams. Um, you'll notice that in, we are using named constructor arguments here. Um, that's actually the reason why historically um, we only did this for the for, for beam properties with the P namespace, because constructor arguments, of course, uh, in the Java language, um, they have a name, but in um, in the actual class file, there is no immediate representation of constructor argument name. Spring, um, on the other hand, is now in recent generations capable of taking those names into account um, by Parsing class arg with ASM using the debug information that class files often contain. So as long as you compile your classes with um, debug information encoded, with debug symbols encoded, Spring will be able to resolve such configuration against the construct argument names that you used in your source code, as you would expect. It's not entirely trivial, but it works in 99% of the cases as long as you compile with debug symbols. 